six scholars of that caliber. And thank you, Jessica. You you know you have done a wonderful job of representing one of the scholars. In that same vein, um, you all have received your renewal membership forms for next year in the mail, and we encourage you to fill those out and send them in. And in order to continue doing what we've done for 60 years, we encourage you to take some extra um, applications. There are some that are on the tables, and there are some that are out in the hallway on the, um, the table out here with Carol Moody. Take some extra ones and encourage your friends to join also. It's really important that we keep this tradition alive for all of the reasons that you just heard. Um, the best advertisement, the best encouragement is word of mouth. So I just encourage you to get a couple of friends to join us. It's fun for us individually and it's good for us as a group. Also, in your program, if you want to read bios of each one of our students, please do, because they're just a talented, wonderful group of, of kids. The last thing that I want to mention is that we have one more member event, and that's coming up quite quickly. We're going to host Arya Lipsky, who is our Ann Arbor Symphony conductor, and he's going to be doing a presentation Monday night April 22nd from 4 to 6 at the Alumni Center just next door. Arya is going to tell about his life. He is born and raised in Israel and how he came to be our Ann Arbor Symphony conductor. I have heard him a couple of times. He is a marvelous presenter and I know that if you can come you would enjoy it. The tickets are $10. Mary Pearson is here at table 19, which I think, it, oh, she's got her hand up back there. She would be happy to take reservations today, or you can feel free to give her a call or an email, too. So we look forward to seeing as many of you and your guests at that event as possible. Now I will turn it over to Mark Bianchi. Well, this afternoon, I have to tell you about a little tiny bit about our speaker. I'm not going to tell you much because she's got a tale to tell. Our speaker has been through one of the most terrifying, life-changing experiences that I hope never to have. Before she was 10 years old, Perrette Simpson survived the most horrific accident collision that the world had ever known. The collision between the Italian luxury liner Andrea Doria and the Swedish liner Stockholm. Perrette has spent many years of her life researching that frightening night, and one result of this research is her award-winning book. Now I find out that she's got three award-winning books. But alive on the Andrea Doria is the story of the greatest sea rescue in the history of the world. After her presentation, Ms. Simpson will be in the lobby with her exciting book, and I add that she has graciously donated a part of the proceeds of the book to our Waterman group. There are special pricings for the book, and I will get those to you after her presentation. Um, and also, you will notice that you have index cards and pencils or pens on your, pay, on your, uh, your tables. If you have questions that come up during her presentation, jot down that question. Perhaps she can answer them. I guarantee she'll answer them. May I present Pierrette Simpson? Why a 
book that was going to be my humble autobiography and a collection of survivor stories actually also became an investigation and a legal defense. We're going to solve the mystery that has been called of the Andrea Doria. I've been told many times that I survived this incident so that I could tell you about it. The story of the nine-year-old surviving the most catastrophic collision in history, but also the greatest collision in history and surviving the greatest sea disaster with the greatest sea rescue. But first, I want to thank some special ladies for making this possible. I wouldn't be here talking with you today if it weren't for the most organized event planners I've ever met. <laughs> Marge Bianchi, Louise Taylor, Millie Irwin, and Susie. Susan, I don't see you out for the here, I'm sure. There she is. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate your interest. How many of you remember? I have a feeling there's a few of you <laughs> that might remember that event when it actually happened almost 57 years ago. Would you raise your hand? Oh my goodness. Well, obviously it's our age, but you also have good memories. That is, that's amazing. You know, you also made history. Do you realize that? Because if you watched it on television, you watched the first major event to ever be covered on real-time television. And I bet you made another historic sensation, and that is that you watched it on your first TV set. <laughs> right? Well, I bet there's a few of you in here who didn't raise their hand. Maybe you've watched the Seinfeld episode about it? <laughs> Where George goes to sign a lease and he wants to rent an apartment in New, York, in New York and the landlord says, I'm sorry, Mr. Costanza, but I've decided to lease it to an Andrea Doria survivor because I pity him. And George was just annoyed. The power of comedy can also resurrect history, obviously. Now, this is an important question to me. How many of you have some kind of little connection to the Andrea Doria? I am always amazed of how this one ship, one event, has assembled so many connections. I talked to a lady today, Sienna, I believe her name is, raise your hand if I have that correct. Her son, Derek, has fragments of the Stockholm, the perpetrator of the Andrea Doria. I mean, what are the chances of that? And then another lady, Marsha, she said that her cousin, I believe, was on the Andrea Doria with me during that event. That is amazing. Now, what makes this event still sensational so many years later? Is it because it was the most recent sea collision in the Western world? Now, I'm not talking about that one that hit rocks. Okay? Is it because it was most likely to be another Titanic? Or is it because, and perhaps some will say still is, the most politically controversial maritime disaster in history. I'd like to think it's all of the above. But first, before I get into all of this, I would like to make a disclaimer. There are some of you, I'm sure, that are of Swedish descent here. <laughs> and I'm going to be talking about the Swedes and the Italians. Please know that I am not talking about Swedish people in general. <laughs> I'm only talking about the Swedish people in that particular event. I've been to Sweden, 
I have lived with the Swedish family, and they are most gracious people. <laughs> so you understand where I'm coming from, right? Okay. Well, let me begin with my personal story. In July of 1956, my family, my grandparents, and I were emigrating from northern Italy to Detroit. We were coming to, for me, meet my mother. She had left when I was 15 months old. She left post-World War II Italy because she wanted to provide a better life for me. It was typical then of immigrants to do that. She would send letters, come to America, the new world. You won't have to work on the farm from morning to night. The meat's already cut up and packaged in the grocery store. Everybody has a car, a TV set. I'm sure this is where I formulated my concept of the American dream. So my grandparents made the ultimate sacrifice. They left the community at the foot of the Alps of 120 people, the community, the only one they had ever known in their lives. They liquidated everything and placed their most important possessions on the unsinkable liner, Andrea Doria. Now, it wasn't just a passenger liner. It was actually the icon that represented Italy's resurgence from the ashes of World War II. Now, in order to do that, the Italian line hired 40 of its grandest artisans to decorate the interiors and design the architecture of the Andrea Doria. It had gleaming mosaics, Venetian Shand crystal chandeliers, crystal china, murals, paintings, statues adorned the interiors of the ship. But it was the most modern, with modern turbines, air conditioning, and three swimming pools unheard of before, one on every class deck. It was a floating art museum with radar. The first eight days, we traveled in luxury. On the eighth evening, we were so looking forward to disembarking the next morning. It was July 25th. It was a very foggy day. The fog was so dense, our foghorn was sounding every two minutes as prescribed by maritime law. That evening, my grandmother and I decided to celebrate with other immigrants, and a spontaneous band broke out, and everyone was dancing. We were going to be in the new world, America, in the morning. Now, my grandfather was the prudent one. He was always taking care of his American dream. It was in his briefcase. He checked in in his cabin, was fast asleep at 11, 10 p.m. Ignoring the foggy conditions outside, we danced, we sang. Thank <laughs> you. 
those other words. <laughs> How did we react? 
react to this horrific episode? Well, let me start with my grandmother and I, who were in the social hall. Now, Nona, my grandma, was dramatic under normal circumstances. <laughs> that night, so as not to frighten me. She maintained her composure like a different person. She just hung on to me. We prayed. We prayed for Nono, who was downstairs in the cabin. We tried to avoid the furniture that was flying everywhere, and people were hysterical. And finally, I remember my no-no coming through those dead doors with his steel blue eyes bulging out of his head. He had awakened, gotten dressed, rolled up his pants, ran through the corridors, like the ones in Poseidon, you know, filled with debris and water, pushed his way up the stairs to make it to the social hall to join us. And guess what he was carrying? <laughs> it was the ultimate that he saved that for us and our entry into America. And he was wearing his hat on his head. You know, I have to tell you, it was a little side thing. All those men on the ship, they had gone to their tailors in Italy and made sure they had the best suits to arrive to America. They wanted to make a bella figura, good impression, but they had also heard that Americans didn't dress very well. <laughs> so they were very proud. So we sat together in prayer circles. There was nothing else to do. We heard a static announcement, incomprehensible. We just figured we were doomed. We sat in the prayer circle, and with the Hail Marys and Our Fathers, we heard these punctuations of crashing and collapsing and creaking and smelled very noxious fumes. And then all of a sudden, after hours, a man came through the deck doors and said, you must come out, the lifeboats are here. We're going to be rescued. We couldn't figure out how we were going to climb that steep incline. But some, and I don't even remember how we did that, but somehow we did. They told us to form a human chain, and when we got outside, press against the railing, this inclining liner. Some people slipped, and it was tragic for them. But we made it to the lower side, and we reached these two gentlemen who were passengers. And they tied a thick rope around my waist, and I was screaming. I didn't want to leave my no knees, and I certainly didn't want to go over the edge of the ship in the dark, darkness of night. I had no choice. They hurled me over the railing, and I twirled down into what looked like a black ocean, because the incline was so severe that the lifeboat was concealed underneath it. So, for all I could see, I was going into the water, but some person grabbed my legs and pulled me into that lifeboat. And I cried for my nona. I know, no, they were still up above. And I looked up, and this woman, who had always been tremendously paranoid of water, was coming down the rope on her own accord. That was my Nona, with her purse. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, her leg hit the water, and she but they pulled her in and we were safe. And we looked around and it was all women. <laughs> and we thought, I thought, oh my goodness, I know no, it's not going to come down. 
And you can imagine why we figured men were not going to join us, the law of the sea, right? And I thought, well, my no-no is so elderly, he'll never make it down. He was 10 years younger than I am now. <laughs> down the rope with his hat on his head. And guess what he was carrying? He was clutching on to his American dream to the last moment. And he made it with us. We were so lucky because so many families were separated. Like the Palladino family, two young parents with three little girls, two, three, and four years old, Two of the daughters went into one lifeboat, and that took off. Maria, the four-year-old, went into another lifeboat by herself. It took off. And then the parents followed. They rejoined the two younger daughters, but didn't find Maria until the next night. And somebody happened to see that they were showing her in a Red Cross shelter on television. So they found her, and all that time, they thought she was gone. Then there was, there were, can I take the time to give you a couple wonderful survivor accounts? Especially since you're mostly women. There'll be a lot for men, too, don't worry. But, um, there was Liliana Duner. You might have seen her on the CBS Sunday Morning DVD out there. She was 23, I believe. She was a war bride traveling with her little Maria, two and a half years old. They were stuck in a corner of the ship where nobody was. Lifeboats couldn't see them. No one knew where they were. They were stuck. So after waiting for hours, Liliana, who happened to be a trained swimmer and diver, took the ultimate measure. She said, if I don't attract a lifeboat, we'll never be off the ship. It's sinking. Do you know what she did? She tied a rope that she found somewhere around little Maria's waist and used her as a lure, dangling her over the ocean. But the little girl panicked. She raised her arms. Mom, 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 and fell through the, the rock into the ocean. Liliana instinctively dove, died into the ocean. The first time, she did not find her. So she dove again, and she brushed up against little girl's body, and it was her Maria, of course. So they started swimming. The lifeboat was coming to them. It worked. Liliana started swimming with the little girl under her arm. But then she noticed that there was a teenager who had frozen with the rope in her hands along the hull of the Doria. And she wouldn't come down. And Liliana knew that she had to get her to come down. So she coaxed her down. She said, I'll carry you. So she carried the teenager on her back after the teenager let go of the rope. And they swam to the lifeboat. There's incredible stories of courage. But the most incredible story of all was that of the 14-year-old miracle girl, that's what the media called her, Linda Morgan. Linda was from a high-class family. She was traveling with her parents, her stepfather, and her mother were sleeping in the cabin next door. He was a New York Times correspondent that had been based in Madrid, and they had been living there for several years. And Linda and her younger sister, eight-year-old Joan, were in the same cabin, Joan on the inside, and Linda on the outside. You can picture this. Linda was sitting on her mattress, and she was writing in her famous autograph book with a lot of movie star autographs. So there's a picture of it. 
in my book because I interviewed Linda. She doesn't talk to the media very often because they've hounded her for years, but a fellow survivor she was willing to talk to, and she actually took a picture of her autograph book and sent it to me. Linda, as she was writing, didn't notice anything when the Stockholm ripped through the bow, cut through her bed, killed her sister immediately, somehow catapulted Linda and her mattress onto the bow of the Stockholm. And she said to me, you know, I looked up and all I could see was the sky. And she said, I couldn't figure out why I could see the sky. And she was calling, Mama, Papa. And the only Spanish-speaking seaman on that ship heard her pleas and came to her. She had broken limbs, but she was okay. Her father never made it off the ship, and her mother was so severely injured she would get very depressed for years on the anniversary of the Andrew Doria and died on one of the anniversaries. <coughs> Many of the people on board the Andrew Doria showed incredible heroism. Even first class passengers became rescuers. And we have to thank the crew, we have to thank people that have been forgotten, and that's the engineers that worked in the bowels of the ship to keep generator after generator, every kind of machinery going. When the air conditioning was gone and they were working in 120 degree heat for hours and hours until they could do no more to keep the ship afloat so that every single passenger that could make it off the ship actually left the ship. Now you're probably asking yourself, I hope you're asking, how could this accident happen during the age of radar? Have you been thinking that? After interviewing many maritime scientists, it was clear that they all called this a radar-assisted collision. Radar-assisted collision? Now you have to understand, before radar, what did mariners do? They took great precautions, right? Safer distances, reduced speed, reinforced manpower on the bridge of command. But radar was supposed to replace these precautions. But still, who made that fatal error? Who made the radar error? In order for you to understand, and it's kind of complicated, I know you can understand it, but I have to set up the scene of the crime, so to speak. So I'm going to give you four statements, and at the end of the four statements, there'll be a quiz. <laughs> the teacher and me. And I want you to answer, which ship do you think I'm talking about? Number one, she was traveling 20 miles north in an illegal lane assigned to westbound traffic as she was traveling east. Number two, there were only three young men on the bridge of command with the third officer in charge for the first time of bridge duty. He was assisted by a 22-year-old helmsman and an 18-year-old crow's lookout. Number three, she had a helmsman who confessed to being bored and would yaw the ship four to seven degrees. With every degree throwing off their position, by a possible 50%. Number four, her third officer made a 22 degree 
right turn as a correction just minutes before the collision. Okay, let's see how smart you are. <laughs> Which ship was I describing? That is correct, the Stockholm. Now you're getting the picture of what might have happened, right? But you're still wondering, well, why that 22 degree correction? Okay, let's look at the evidence. That overworked, inexperienced young third officer was using an antiquated radar scope. It didn't even have a light in it. That's how antiquated it was. So he looked inside. He figured he was on the 15-mile range scale when he was actually on the 5-mile range scale. Therefore, he placed the Andrea Doria 12 miles away when in fact it was only four miles away. Now remember that helmsman? He was yawing the ship. So when the third officer took a reading, it was thrown off. So he thought the Andrea Doria was approaching on the left. We were never approaching on the left. We were approaching on the right. It was the yawing that threw off the reading. So that's why he turned right. He thought he was distancing himself from us when he was actually stalking us. And then, when he saw that we crossed his path meters in front of him, either out of panic or out of training to turn right and passing, he made another very quick, he ordered a quick hard to starboard, another hard right. That's when he delivered the fatal blow to our ship. Now, unfortunately, this information didn't reach anyone, including scientists, for a long time of what really had happened. And you're probably wondering, well, how did they determine what had happened? Well, I can tell you, there's a very sophisticated computer simulation laid out at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy in New York, where I went to study it two times, and it shows the approach of the Stockholm, the approach of the Andrew Doria, and that computer simulation puts to scrutiny all of the human testimony and the course recorder information, and it can discern and replay what happened. Now, unfortunately, this information never reached the public. So the Italian crew was blamed for decades. And I was part of the, the people who said, oh, the officers must have been celebrating that night. We really didn't know. The shame of us. We had been broadsided. The other ship was traveling in an illegal lane. It wasn't sounding its fog alert horns. It was not on fog standby, ready to stop when it should have in any emergency situation. Now, why was this, this place blamed? You're a smart audience. What do you think was the image of Italians back then? I think that had a lot to do with it. Post-World War II, go ahead, tell me something. What was their image? Ignorant, I think I heard? Correct. Cowardly, dishonest, emotional, irrational. What was the image of the Nordic people? Cool, intelligent, rational, educated, right? What other stereotypes? Precise. I'm sorry. Precise. Precise, oh yes, of course, of, of the uh, Nordic people, of course. Wasn't there mafia? Wasn't there Mussolini? I mean, really, it's realistic. And what about the fact that we were Catholic, and the 
and Nordic people were Protestant. Let's face it, that played a factor with Kennedy's candidacy, with Mitt Romney's candidacy. It's still an issue, isn't it? But the most damaging factor of all, and this is hard to forgive, is that a New York Times correspondent by the name of Alvin Moscow was invited by the Swedish American line to live in Stockholm for 18 months with his wife to write a book on the account. This book came out called Collision Course. You can get it. Don't recommend it. <laughs> but it's well written, but it's obviously very biased against Italians. It's obvious that according to Mr. Moscow, Captain Columbi was guilty by the fact that he was Italian. He became the scapegoat right from the beginning because of this ethnic stereotyping. Now, you're probably okay. saying, wasn't there a trial to discern a verdict? How many of you think there was a trial? You're right. There was no trial. There were four months of pre-trial hearings in New York. They didn't go well for Captain Calamai and the Italian crew. We spoke no English. The Swedish people did. Captain Calamai was too stoic. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. And the blame, he just wouldn't speak up for himself. And Captain Nordensen, he kind of showed up once in a while, but he was sick the rest of the time. Then, while this was happening for four months, the survivors, <laughs> the survivors were sending in their claims. We had itemized every single thing we lost in our trunks. That was a lot. And we submitted it to the courts. And it was obvious that this was becoming the costliest maritime disaster in history. Well, there were insurance companies for both ships, obviously. Do you know who they were? Lloyd's of London? For which ship? For the Stockholm? Well, who insured the other ship, the Andrea Doria? This lady knows. Lloyd's of London. Are you kind of getting feeling for something here? Now, would Lloyds of London, who's the insurer for both ships, want to get to the bottom of this? Would it matter if they paid from their left pocket or their right pocket? They were still going to have to pay out, but hopefully by stopping all of this very quickly, they would pay out less. So one day, they announced to the media that they had halted the hearings and that there would be a no-fault verdict because there wasn't enough evidence. In spite of all the human testimony and in spite of the two course recorders, they could not come up with a fault. And they made everyone during the pretrial hearings swear to secrecy. What does that tell you? Then, a brilliant maritime attorney came up with a loophole in an old law that said that the value of what was on the ship was based on the post-collision uh, condition of the ships. Post-collision. So we had the damaged bow of the Stockholm that had dropped into the ocean still afloat, $5 million. That floating art museum, the jewel of the Italian line, the flagship, $1 million. So instead of getting compensated for $150 million that we had submitted in claims, we got what? 
six million dollars. Those who studied this case have said in an office in London, there had obviously been a conspiracy to obstruct justice. Now there were two mariners, one that I met and collaborated with as I wrote the book. And they had done all the research to show that Captain Calamai was innocent. And they had been writing letters to him. So 16 years later, they made their way to Genoa with the evidence. And they were met on the pier by his two daughters. And they said, our father passed away two months ago. And he never read your correspondence. He checked himself into the hospital, complaining of malaise. And his last words in a semi-conscious state were, are the passengers saved? This was 60 years later. It's as if that twisted bow, that twisted iron of the Stockholm became symbolic of the twist of fate that befell a great maritime nation. The nation that produced Marco Polo, Amerigo Vespucci, Christopher Columbus. We were told by our own public relations department, and I saw the letters, I read every correspondence, to use dignified silence. Don't talk to the media, because we can't win. We're Italian. This, all the while, the Swedish-American line, very brilliantly, and I give them a lot of credit, they produced this positive image campaign. And guess what it included? Promoting the officers on the Stockholm. Now, all of this drowned out that news that Captain Kalamai had carried on the greatest sea rescue to tell you a little side story. 30 seconds. The Swedish American line and their attorneys announced to the media that the Andrea Doria didn't sink because they rammed us. We sank because we had a built-in defect. Mm -hmm. But ironically, they were sending Captain Norrison to Italy to pick up their new ship, the Griff's home, that was being built by the same line as the, the same shipyard as the Andrea Doria. Well, the ship workers, shipyard workers, when they heard Captain Jordison would be coming, after being humiliated, they went to the streets and they striked. <laughs> they said, we will not release their ship to that man. So they had to send another captain. Meanwhile, Captain Calamai had been promised the command of the sister ship of the Andrea Doria. He waited and waited, and it never came. He felt vilified, he felt abandoned by his own people, and he felt ashamed to have tarnished the lineage of Calamai men throughout the centuries. The media was the only entity that hounded him and remembered him. And one day he announced to it, I used to love the sea, and now I hate it. That pretty well tells a lot, doesn't it? I want to read to you the obituary in the New York Times by one of the gentlemen who actually vindicated him. Remember, this is an obituary, 1972. I quote, the most tragic figure to come out of this disaster was Captain Pietro Calamai, master of the Andrea Doria. A victim of circumstances, he was alone, brokenhearted. Companies and individuals, no one defended him. Captain Calamai, 
was the least responsible. Unquote. There were many casualties in this affair. The captain's brilliant career, 51 lives when we count the five seamen on the Stockholm, 46 on the Doria, the crown jewel of the Italian mine and its glorious artwork, prized personal possessions, fair compensation. But the greatest casualty of all was truth. Since there was no trial, a line of the Andrew Doria replaces the proceedings that never were. If you decide to read it, you will become the judge and jury. You'll discover once again the wisdom of Winston Churchill. I love his quotes. He says, quote, the truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but in the end, there it is. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. survivors, uh, Giovanna Palombo Zamparo, and I have her story in the book. I never had a waistline like that. <laughs> and that's her purse. Yeah. Was there such a thing as stress counseling in those days? That's a good question. There was. There was. I don't know if they called it that, but there was help. I think a lot of it from the Red Cross and yeah, you know, did show up. It took the Stockholm over one hour to launch lifeboat. Lifeboats, address this please. I think they had to go throughout the ship and make sure that it could stay there and help. Otherwise, it might have needed help also. So I'm surprised that they were able to do it that quickly. I mean, there had been a lot of damage on the Stockholm as well. So it had to be evaluated. Hope that answers that question. What was life for your family after the shipwreck? My grandparents, except for the day after the collision, they talked to the newspaper at that point. They never wanted to talk about that incident again. My grandmother was so paranoid of water, especially after that, she couldn't even walk by a lake. My grandfather was just terrified from, traumatized from the whole thing. Um, some of the survivors I interviewed said they couldn't go by water at all. One said, couldn't take a bath. And a lot of them had to have counseling to face water. And I can understand that. Two more. What kept the water from pouring in when the hole was so big? You were floating so long, and you were floating so long. The water poured in by the tons. Remember that jackhammer effect that opened up? The water was pouring in tremendously, and that's when the sinking started. Now, I think I forgot to mention this. The list was so dramatic that we had no lifeboats functioning immediately. The ones on the port side were so inclined upward that they would not release to the water from their davits. The ones on the right side, they were dangling out from the hull several yards so they couldn't be launched. 
So we had to wait to be dropped into the lifeboats or plunge into the water, just make our way any way we could. Why did we stay afloat for so long? It really had to do with the ingenious craftsmanship of the Andrea Dorio. Even one of the attorneys uh, after the trial, many years after, said that only a ship with that kind of craftsmanship could have stayed afloat for 11 hours. It was admitted later. Oh, another one, okay. Who was on the bridge of the Andrea Doria? Who was monitoring the Andrea Doria radar? I'm glad you asked. We had Captain Kalamai and another captain. We had several officers on the bridge. We had a very modern radar. And we saw that there was another ship approaching on our right, but almost a mile away. But the captain thought that it was strange that the ship would be approaching on our starboard side. He thought, really, should be on the other side by, by law. But he thought, we've got nine-tenths of a mile. We'll just stay put. Now, they didn't have bridge-to-bridge -bridge communication back then. So how could he have known that that third officer was going to make that 22 degree correction unannounced in the fog? We couldn't see them. And then another hard to write. And he tried to turn our ship when he actually visibly saw us, saw the other ship approaching. He missed that turn by 11 seconds. What was the radar on the Andrew Dorio? Did it detect when the stock was close by? I think I answered that. It took 11 hours to sink till the next morning. We kept the water from pouring in. From the first impact, how long did it take for the ship to sink? I answered that, the 11 hours. so much. It was a pleasure talking to all of you. Thank you for being so attentive and so interested. I really appreciate it.